Hi, we're back, we're watching, you're watching theCUBE coverage of Falcon 2022 live from the ARIA in Las Vegas, Dave Vellante with Dave Nicholson. And we, yes folks, there are females in the cybersecurity industry. Amanda Adams is here, she's the Vice President of America <laughs> Alliance at CrowdStrike. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having uh, me. It's, it's fantastic to, to actually, I was starting to wonder, but. We do have <laughs> females in leadership. I'm just kidding, I there know. are plenty of females here. <laughs> but the cybersecurity industry in general, we'll, maybe we'll, if we have time we can talk about that, but I want to talk about the, the Alliance program, but before I do, yeah. you know, you've you got a nice career here at CrowdStrike. Right. You've kind of seen the ascendancy, the rocket ship, you've been on it for five years. Yep. So what's that been like? And if you had to put on the binoculars and look five years forward, what can you tell us in that 10 year span? Oh my goodness, what a journey it's been over the last five, six years I've been with CrowdStrike, almost six years and really starting with our first core group of partners and building out the alliances, seeing obviously the transformation with our sales organization as we scaled. I think of our, of our technology, we started with I think two products at that time we were focused on reinventing how our customers thought about next gen AV but also endpoint detection and response. Um, from there the evolution is really driving towards that cloud security platform, right? how our partners fit into that and, and how we've evolved is, it's not just resell, it's not just focusing on the margin and transactions. We really have focused on building the strategic relationships with our partners, but also our customers and fitting them in that better together story with that CrowdStrike platform. Uh, it's been the biggest shift. Yeah, and you've got the, the platform chops for that. It's, it's right. I think you're up to 22 modules now. So you're not a point product. You That's guys right. make that, 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 that point a lot. Now in terms of the, the partners and the ecosystem, you know, it's, it's, it's good here, I mean, yeah. it's, this, it's, it's buzzing. I've said it's like service, I've said a number of times, it's like service now back in 2013, yeah. I was there. Now they didn't have the down market, the SMB that you have. That's right. Um, and I think you, you're going to have an order, you got 20,000 customers. That's right. I predict CrowdStrike's going to have 200,000. Um, I'm not going to predict when, I need <laughs> to think about that. But, but in thinking about the, the, the col your colleagues and yeah. the partners and the skill sets that have evolved, what's critical today and, and, and what do you see as critical in the future? So from a skill set standpoint, if I'm a partner and engaging with CrowdStrike and our customers, if you think about, again, evolving away from just resell, we have eight routes to market. So while that may sound complicated, the way that I like to think about it is that we truly flex to our partners, go to market, their business models of what works best for their organization but also their customers. Uh, the way that they've changed, I think, from a skill set standpoint is looking beyond just the technology from a platform, building a better together story with our Tech Alliance partners or store. Um, if you're thinking about the XDR Alliance, which we are focusing on, there's so much great value in bringing that to our customers. Um, from a skill set standpoint, beyond those services, services we've talked about, every Every day, I know that this is going to be a top topic for the week. Uh, yesterday, through our partner summit, George, our CEO, as well as Jim Seidel, that's really the opportunity as we expand into new modules. If you think about Humio or log scale, identity, and then cloud, our partners play a critical role when it comes into the cloud migration, deployment, integration services. Really, we're not going to get bigger from a services organization, and that's where we need our partners to step in. Yeah, and you know we. We've talked a lot about XDR yeah. already in yeah. day one here. Yeah. Um, with, with the X extending into other areas, That's right. I think that services be would become even more critical at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, as you spread out into the really the internet of things, That's right. especially all of the old things that are out there that maybe should be on the internet but aren't yet. Yeah. But once they are, security is important. So what are you doing in that arena from a services perspective to to bolster that capability, is it is it is it internally or is it through partners generally? It's definitely, I think, we look to our partners to extend beyond the core of what we do. We do endpoint really well, right? Our services is one of the best in the business when you look at instant response, our proactive services, supporting our customers. If you think to XDR of integration, building out those connector packs with our customers, building the alliances, we really do work with our partners to drive that uh, successful outcome with our customers. But also too, I think about it with our tech alliances of building out the integration, that takes a lot of effort and work. We have a great team internally which will help guide those services to be, to be built, right? You have to have uh, support when you're building the integrations, which is great. Um, but really from like a tech alliance and store standpoint, looking to add use cases, add value to more store apps for our customers, that's where we're headed, right? What about developers? Do you see that as a component of the ecosystem in the future? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I think that uh, as our partner program evolves right now, working with our, our developers, I mean, there's different personas that we work with with our customer standpoint, but from a partner, uh, working with them to build our new codes, the integration, that's going to be 
pretty important. So we were, we were sort of tongue in cheek at the beginning of this interview yeah. uh, with women in tech, and it's a, it's a topic that on theCUBE that we've been very passionate about since day one yep. uh, on theCUBE. So how'd you get in to, to this business? H how did your, your career progress? How did you get to where you are? You know, I have been incredibly fortunate to have connections, uh, and I think it's who you know and your network. Not necessarily what you know to a certain extent. You have to be smart to make it long term, right? You have to have integrity, do what you're saying you're going to do. Uh, I first started at Cisco, and I had a, a connection of, it was actually a parent of somebody I grew up with. And they're like, you would fit in very nicely to Cisco. And I started with their channel marketing team, learned a ton about the business, how to structure, how to support, and that was the first step into technology. If you would have asked me, 20 years ago, what did I want to do? I actually wanted it to be a GM of an organization. And I was coming out of, I know, Come which on. is great. Which is, I'm, uh, it really is right up, if you knew me, you'd be like, that actually makes a lot of sense. But um, coming out of college, I had an opportunity, I was interviewing with the Golden State Warriors in California, and I was interviewing with Cisco. And I had two ops, and I was living in San Jose at the time. The Golden State Warriors, of course, paid less. Uh, it was a better opportunity in sales, but it was it obviously where I wanted to go from athletics. I grew up in athletics playing volleyball. Uh, Cisco paid me more and it was in San Jose. And really the, the Golden State Warriors team that I was having that conversation, they said, one year commute is going to be awful. It's awful from San Jose to Oakland, uh, but also too, like you have more money on the table, go take that. And so I could have very much ended up in athletics, uh, most likely in the back office somewhere. I would, like, I would love that. Uh, and then from there, I went from Cisco, and I actually worked for a reseller for quite some time, looking at it or selling into Manhattan when I moved uh, from California to Manhattan, went to Tenable, and that was when I shifted really into channel management. Uh, I love relationships, getting to know people, building partnerships, seeing that long term, that's really where I thrive. And then from there came to CrowdStrike, which in itself has been an incredible journey. I'll bet. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's an important thread there to pull on. And that is, um, we, we put a lot of emphasis on STEM, which people some, sometimes translate into one thing, writing code. That's right. There are, but would you agree, there are many, many, many opportunities in tech that aren't just coding. Absolutely. And I think, I, as a father of three daughters, <laughs> it's, it's a message that I have shared with them. Yeah. They are not interested in the coding part of things but still they need to know that there are so many opportunities. And, and it's always, sometimes it's happenstance in terms of finding the opportunity. In your case, it was, you know, cosmic connection. That's right. Uh, but but that's, you know, that's something that we can foster is that idea that it's not just about the hardcore engineering and coding aspect. It's business. That's right. So if, the, if there was one thing that I can walk away from today is, I say that all the time, right? If you look at CrowdStrike and our mission, we really don't have a mission statement, we stop breaches. Every single day when I come to work and I support our partners, I'm not super technical, I obviously know our technology and I, I enable and train our partners, but I'm not coding, right? And I make an impact to our business, our partners, more importantly, our customers every single day. Uh, we have folks that you can come from a marketing, operations, there is legal, there's finance. I deal with folks all across the business that aren't super technical, but are making a huge impact. Um, and I, I don't think that we talk about the opportunities outside of engineering with the broader groups. We talk about STEM a lot, uh, but within college, and I look to see like getting those early in career folks, either through an intern program, could be sales, but also too, if they don't like sales and then they shift into marketing or operations, it's a great way to get into the industry. Yeah, but I still think you got to like tech to be in the tech oh, business. Oh, you do. You know? Yeah, sure. you do, I'm not It's like you. deep down, it's like, not all of us, but a lot of us are kind of just, you know. Well, at least geeks. you, at least you so, can't hate it. Right, okay, but so <laughs> women, 50% of the population, I think the That's stat right. is 17% in the technology yeah. industry. Maybe it's changed a little bit, but you know, 20% or, or less. Why do you think that is? Uh, I, you know, I always go back to within technology, people hire from their network and people that they know, and usually your network are people that are very like-minded or similar to you. Um, I have referred females into CrowdStrike, it's a priority of mine. I also have a circle that is also men, um, but also too, if you look at the folks that are hired into CrowdStrike, but also other technology companies, that's the first thing that I go to. Um, also, I think it's a little bit intimidating, right? I have a very strong personality, and I'm very direct, but also too, like I can keep up with 
our industry when it comes to that um, stereotypes essentially. And some people maybe are introverted and they're not quite sure where they fit in, right? Uh, whether it's marketing, operations, et cetera. And so they, they're not sure of the opportunities or even aware of where to get started. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think there is a, a, a stereotype to that, but I'm not sure why it's, is it unique to the, to the technology industry? No. Is it not, right, it happens. Thinking. I mean, there's right. so many industries where. Healthcare, maybe not so much, right, because, you know, uh, you have nurses versus doctors. I feel like that is flipped. Yeah, that's true. Nurses versus doctors, right? Yeah. Uh, I, well, I know, I know a lot of women doctors, though. But yeah, that's kind yeah, of flipped. That's better. Yeah, yeah that's, that's flipped over. Yeah, recently. I think it's more women in medical school now, but uh, than than men. But and, and I do think in our industry, you know, when you look at companies like IBM, HPE, Cisco, uh, Dell, uh, and, and and many others, yeah, they are making a concerted effort for around diversity. They typically have somebody who's in charge of diversity, they report, you know, maybe not directly to the CEO, but they certainly have a seat at the table. That's right. Um, and you know, maybe you call it, oh, it's qu quotas, maybe the, the old white guys feel, you know, a little slighted, whatever. It's like nobody's crying for us. Uh, I mean, it's not like we got screwed. See, hay uno problema, years. we can do this in Spanish. Oh, oh, oh you're not an old white guy, we sorry. Can, we can do sorry. this in Spanish if you're you want, Vermonte. Right, okay. There we go. So, <laughs> no, but, but, but I, so I do think, that, that the industry in general, I talked to John Chambers about this recently, and he was like, look, we got to do way better. And I don't disagree with that, but I think, that, I think the industry is doing better. But I wonder if like a rocket ship company like CrowdStrike, who has so many other things going on, you know, maybe they got to get to a certain size. I mean, you've reached escape velocity. You're doing obviously a lot of corporate you know, good. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and we just had earlier on, we had, you know, uh, motorsports, motorsports guys, it was yeah. very cool. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's a maturity thing, maybe these larger companies with, you know, CrowdStrike's $40 billion market cap, but maybe the, the 100 plus billion dollar market cap companies, I don't know. I don't know, you guys got a bigger market cap than Dell, so. See, I, w I don't think it's necessarily related to market cap, I think it's the <laughs> size of the organization of how many roles are open um, that we currently, right? So we're at uh, just over 6,000 employees. If you look at Cisco, how many thousands of employees they have, there's right, more Right, maybe 100,000 employees. Right. That's right, and there's more opportunities. How many, what's the headcount of CrowdStrike? Just over 6,000. 6,000, so okay. But if you think about the, the areas of opportunity for advancement, and we were talking about this earlier, when you look at early and career or entry level, it's actually quite even, right, uh, across the Americas of, we do have a great female population, and then as uh, progression happens, that's where it, it teeters off from a, a female in leadership, um, and we're doing, we're focusing on that, right, under JC Herrera's leadership as well as with George. Uh, one of the things that I always think is important, though, is that you're mindful as, as the female within the organization and that you're out seeking somebody who's not only a mentor, but is a direct champion for you when you're not in the room, right? Uh, this is true of CrowdStrike, it's true of every organization. You're not going to be aware of the opportunities as the roles are being created, and really as the roles are being created, they probably have somebody in mind, right? And so if you have somebody that's in that room that says, you know what, Amanda Adams would be perfect for that. Let's go talk to her about it. You have to have somebody who's your champion. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a saying that 80% of the most important moments in your life happen in your absence. And that's exactly that's right. you know when there when someone needs to be there to champion you. Did that happen for you? Yes, I have a very strong champion. So I mean, I, my observation is if if you're a woman in tech, and you're in a senior leadership position like you are, or you're a you're a general manager or a PNL manager or a CEO, you have to be so incredibly talented, mm -hmm. um, because all things being equal, maybe it's changing somewhat in some of those companies I talked about. But for the last thirty years. You, all things being equal, a, a, a woman is going to lose out mm -hmm. to a man who is as qualified. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's maybe slowly changing. Maybe you agree with that, maybe you don't. And maybe that's, some people think that's unfair, but you know, think about people of color, right? They, 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 they grew up with less op opportunities for education. And this is just the statistics. That's right. Right, so should society overcompensate for that? I personally think yes. The, the answer is yes, they should. There should still be some type of meritocracy. That's right. You know, but society has a responsibility to you know, rise up all ships. 
I think there's a couple ways that you can address that through Falcon Fund, scholarship programs, looking Absolutely. at supporting the folks that are coming out of school, our internship program, providing those opportunities, um, but then just being mindful, right, of whether or not you publish the stats or not. We do have somebody who's responsible for DEI within CrowdStrike. Um, they are looking at that and at least taking that step to understand what can we do to support the advancement across minorities, but also women is really, really important. Did you not have a good educational opportunity <laughs> when you were growing up? Were you like, you had to, Me? Yeah, no, seriously. No, seriously, I went to uh, pretty scary schools. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so you could have gone down a really bad path. I, a lot of people that I grew up with went down really, really bad paths. Um, I think the inflection point, uh, at least for me, what the inflection point was becoming aware of this entire universe. Yeah. I was, I was headed down a path where I wasn't aware that any of this existed. When I got out of college, they were advertising in the newspaper for Cisco, sales engineers, $150,000 a year, we will train. I'm a smart guy. I had no idea what that meant. Right. I could have easily gone and gotten one of those jobs. It was seven or eight years before I intersected with the tech world again. And so, um, you know, kind of parallel with your experience with you had someone randomly, it's like, you'd be great at Cisco. Yeah. But if, if you're not around that, and so you take people in different communities who are just, this might as well be a different planet. Yes. Yeah. The idea of eating in a restaurant where someone is serving you food is uncomfortable. Right. The idea of checking into a hotel, the idea of flying somewhere on an airplane. We talk about imposter syndrome. That's right. There are deep-seated discomfort levels that people have because they just, this is completely foreign. But, but you're saying you could, have, you could have gone down a path where selling drugs or jacking cars was, was, was lucrative. I had, I had, yeah. I mean, we're getting, we're getting like deep into societal things. I was, I was very lucky. My parents were very, very young, but they're still together to this day. I had loving parents. We were very, very poor. We were surrounded by really, really, really bad stuff. So, okay. So, so okay. So this, I, I don't, I don't compare my situation an educated to others. Yeah. White woman. That uh, I guess my, this is my point. The yeah. dynamic is different than a, than a kid who grew up in the inner city. Yes. Right. And yeah. and and they're both important. To address, but yeah, I think you got to address them in different ways. But yes. if they're but if they're both completely ignorant of this, they don't know it. So it's and a they'll lack of never be here. Well, they'll yeah, never be here. here. And it's such a huge. This is such a huge difference from the rest of the world and from the rest yeah. from the rest of our so economy. So what would you tell a young girl? My daughters aren't interested in tech. They want to go into fashion or healthcare or whatever. Dave's daughters maybe would be a, a young girl, preteen, maybe teen, interested in not sure which path. <laughs> Why tech, what advice would you give? I think it's just understanding what you enjoy about life, right? Like which skills are you great at? What characteristics about roles? And not really focusing on a specific product, definitely not cybersecurity versus the, like the broader network. I mean, literally what do you enjoy doing? And then the roles of, you know, from the skill set that's needed, whether that be marketing, and then you can start to dive into, do I want to support marketing for a corporate environment, for retail, for technology, like that will come. And follow your passion, which I know is so easy to say, right? But if you're passionate about certain things, I love relationships. I think that uh, holding myself from integrity standpoint, leading with integrity, but building strong relationships on trust, that's something I take really pride in and, and what I get enjoyment it's, with. It's obviously your superpower. It, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it will go back to, also to just being authentic in the process of building those relationships, being direct to the transparency of understanding, like again, knowing what you're good at and then where you can fit into an organization, awareness of technology, opportunities, I think we'll all lend that to it. But I also wouldn't worry, like when I was 17 year old, I, I thought I would be playing volleyball in college and then going to work for a professional sports team, you know? Life works out very differently. Yeah, right, and, and, and for those of you out there, so I love that, thank you for that. A, a great interview, really appreciate you letting us go far afield. For those of you who might say, well, I don't know, I mean, I don't know what my passion is. I'll give you a line from my daughter, Alicia. You don't learn a lot for your kids. She said, well, if you don't know what your passion is, follow your curiosity. That's great. There you go. Amanda Adams, thanks so much. Thank it was great so to much. have you on. Okay, thank you. Keep it right there. We're back with George Kurtz. We're after this short break. Dave Vellante, Dave Nicholson. You're watching theCUBE from Falcon 22 in Las Vegas.